Well, hey, Matt, thank you so much for joining me. We've been trying to schedule this, I think, for like a year now. Um, so it is great to see you finally face to face. Yes, nice to see you too. No pressure, build up of one year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's funny. Uh, I kind of built my YouTube. My the intention was it the intention was to interview people, and then I realized how difficult it is to schedule these things. And yep. so I said, you know what, I'll just post like market reviews and stuff like that. And so um, you actually are my second guest and I've had the channel Great. for like almost two years. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely, definitely hard difficult. to find yeah. scheduling time for, for people, especially yeah. in different time zones. So yeah, I'm glad we're finally connecting. Yeah. And uh, it makes it more special because my introduction to you was, was a Richard um, Boglin interview. It was, I think I had been trading for about three years, um, but I was totally in the dark. Um, no books, no YouTube videos, nothing. Um, no Twitter, thank God. Um, because I probably would have been a option scalper, day trader maniac yeah. if I started on Twitter because, you know, the game porn is, it yeah. really entices FOMO. And I think it's, well, I don't know because we're all following different people, but I feel like it's slowed down in 2022, right? Um, as, as opposed to 2020 and that's, yeah, you know, well, for sure, that's what uh bear markets will do to you. But yes, it's, they're it's still out there. There's no doubt about it. Uh, yeah. It's still out there. Well, so your style of trading really clicked with me because when I was trading essentially in the dark, I had read only one book. It was about, um, it was just about like, um, support and resistance. So that was the only knowledge I had. And when I was trading, I was using um at the time I was using Fidelity and they have whenever you click a ticker, it shows like three or four other tickers in the same industry. And so like if I typed in an Apple, it would show Microsoft and IBM. So I would always just pick the one that had the the best performance for the fifty two right. year. Right. Or fifty two week. week. Right. Not even knowing that I'm like buying like sector strength and you know relative strength um and then you know eventually i came across you and richard and and then you had mentioned um um how to make money in stocks and then i read that and then it all clicked uh once i started reading kind of the, the media vinnies and, and things like that yeah i mean there's definitely like a, a knowledge base of work out there from the people that have come before us right and that's kind of the way every field progresses and we we kind of stand on their shoulders. And I just think that trading is, you know, there's a lot of things that are very tailored to you, your own unique personality. But I think people don't realize how, how individual the, the journey is in trading. I, don't, I think people think, you know, I'm going to read all of Mark Minervini's books, which mm -hmm. by the way, I would highly recommend doing, yep. et cetera. You know, insert your favorite, you know, stock market book author's name here. I'm going to read all of their books and then I'm going to have the roadmap and I'm going to know what I'm doing. Right. And, that's not the way it works, right? It'll give you a right. really good foundation and some frameworks and things, but you really have to get in there yourself and, and, you know, grapple with things and, and then understand and listen to what your strengths and weaknesses are and tweak everything. Um, and I think people, I think people really underestimate how personal the journey yeah. is. So I think and, that's a big one. And so, so what would you, what would your advice be to your younger self um, now that you've been trading 20 plus years, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I've got through phases, right? So it's not like there was just day one and then I just like count from there. I mean, I definitely started right. off not knowing what the hell I was doing, not trading all that much and having no idea what I was doing. Went through lots of unprofitable times and I've gone in and out of really trading full time as well. Mm. So there's a lot of differences in that 20 plus years, but I've been actively involved in the market for, I, it's probably closer to 25 years now. Okay. I would say 20 plus and I just keep getting older. Um, so what I would say to my younger self, most likely is, uh, is I should have, uh, you know, paid attention to risk a lot earlier. <laughs> mm. Um, it, it's one of those, it's, it's the lessons that you have to learn the hard way. And I'm, I'm kind of like Mr. Risk management on Twitter, at least. Um, and in, in reality, I think those of us that have been around or that can say that we've been trading for 20 years, I mean, we understand the main focus is risk management because you just you just can't last that long, right? Right. Unless you focus on risk management. And to my younger self, you know, I would say that I wish I had picked up the discipline a lot earlier than I did. But 
it's the it's the way my journey went. You know, there's there's you know there's you you make a lot of mistakes to to come around and and be successful eventually in the end if you stick with it. So, um, I wish I could have said to my myself twenty years ago, you know, you got to focus on risk first, no matter what the size of your account is, et cetera. Right. We saved a lot of time, but you know, the the the, uh, the goal is to get to the point where you realize that, and I'm there. So, right on. <laughs> and so. Awesome. Yeah, go ahead. And so um, in in that kind of transition phase where you realize risk management was important, you, you learned what risk management was because obviously when you, day one, you don't know what a stop loss is unless your dad, you know, unless your dad is David Ryan, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, which his son is doing very well in the um, right. USIC. Right. Um, but uh so unless unless you you kind of grew up like that, you know, when you started making that transition um, from unprofitable to profitable, you obviously are trying to develop rules and things like that. What kind of rules did you set for yourself but kept breaking um, during that kind of transition period, um, if any? Always, yeah. I, I, um. So for me, risk management. I think people when they hear risk management, they just think. All right, stops, and that's it, right? It's like, oh, I've got that nailed. I use stops, so like my risk management is 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 check check mark, you know. Guilty. And to me, it's just such a much bigger, it, like almost everything is based on risk management for me. And it's in terms of progressive exposure, I lump into risk management, knowing when the environment is a tailwind or what, or a headwind, I lump into risk management, knowing when to hit the gas and when to when to play defense. You know, constantly battling what some of us have, and I definitely have my biggest my biggest weakness is over trading at times. Yeah, um, and I call all of that. I risk. I put all of that in the in the category of risk management, right? So it's a it's a much bigger envelope than just simply knowing what my total open risk is and sizing and all that. Those are the nuts and bolts, the foundational kind of backbone of your risk management system. But being aware of your environment, knowing when to get aggressive, when not to get aggressive aligning your expectations with reality, things like that. That's all risk management. So um, I would say in the very beginning, I was, I was just over trading a lot. I mean, that mm -hmm. was my main thing. I was, you know, constantly trying to manufacture something um, when it wasn't there. And it took me a really long time to realize um, that you have to be aware of what your style is. And, and I think that, you know, the people that, that go flitting back and forth from one style to the next or find the next strategy, find the next setup, and I think that's great to do initially because you want to find what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and you're exploring. But eventually, you have to pick an, an, an area where you're going to focus, right? Um, and it's not about suddenly seeing, hey, the market character changed, so I'm going to switch to this strategy. Market character changed, I'm going to switch to that strategy. It sounds right. great. It sounds great. But the reality is very, very few people are, are that perceptive and that quick to adjust that they can just say, hey, the market changed to this strategy is going to work. Mm. And I can just change on a dime and that strategy is going to work. What, what usually ends up happening is you just get chopped up, right. switching from strategy to strategy. And then the feedback you're getting from the market is random, as random as the strategies you're taking. So I think, you know, in a long story short, what, what, what really got me to focus on risk management was realizing that I had to focus on a couple strategies myself. And then that way... Um, I could determine based on the feedback from my account when to hit the gas, when not to hit the gas. And that all played into the bigger part of helping me, um, you know, not over trade and not, not churn my account, not try to constantly manufacture trades that aren't there. Do you find yourself, uh, maybe more than rather than now, um, finding yourself, if you have a, let's say you have a, a down day that you're, you're really trying to at least break even on the day um do you find or did you find yourself or do you find yourself still kind of being in those situations where you're just like really pissed off so you know what, let me just find something um i so, know no, i can do this definitely definitely early on absolutely i mean you get yeah. that, that that urge to revenge trade and, yeah um you know i've got to i've got to get back to even so no that i mean that's one of those that's one of those things that goes into that bucket of risk management i think right so um, you have to, you just start to understand when you're thinking those certain things like revenge trading, just because you want to break even market doesn't give a crap if right. you want to break even, right? <laughs> it does not matter. That only matters to you. Right. And, and I, I think that all feeds into, you know, all the things that can get you in trouble with over trading and just trying to manufacture something that isn't there. Yeah. Like just because you just took a loss, that doesn't mean there's a trade sitting there for you to take, right. That's within your wheelhouse. Yeah. 
Um, so uh, that all goes into that risk management thing. And, and it's, it's such a, it's such an ongoing process and it's a process that never ends. But I, I feel like over these 20 plus years, um, the thing I'm good at now is just that the risk management, you know, operating in an uncertain environment, managing my account, managing, um, you know, the signals that I, that I've learned to read in myself. So I think one of the things people, uh, you know, get wrong is they say, you got to take all emotion out of your trading and you know, that's not accurate, right? We're never going right. to be robots. We're never going to take all the emotion out, but you have to understand when your emotions are leading you astray. That's the key part, right? So um, that's uh, that, that's all part of the risk management thing that I focus on. And so uh, the answer is I try really, really hard not to okay. revenge trade like that. Yeah. So do you think um, the way you overcome that is through um, through the emotional side of trading? Or do you think like setting rules, like I'm only going to take two trades if a day or, or, or one trade a day or, or five trades, you know, whatever it is, three trades a week, um, more of a rule based approach or more just like really self work, really, you know, working on yourself. I think you have to have some key rules. I think you definitely have to have some key rules. I mean, it's a mixture of both. Right. But I think that the rules set you up for success as opposed to if you just don't have any, you're like, I'm going to wing it based on, based on my emotional analysis of myself. I mean, that can get really tricky. Um, so some of my rules are, well, first of all, most of the time I'm a 50, I have a 50% batting average, which means quite literally, I'm going to be wrong half the time. Right. And that's generally what it is. Um, over the past 20 years, that's where it comes out to. Um, so, you know, statistically, just statistically, there's basically a hundred percent chance that in a string of 50 trades, I'm going to get stopped out for losses six times in a row. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I basically have it set up so that if, if I have four five, six losses in a row, I'm taking a break. I mean, even if it's mm. through no mistakes of my own, um, <laughs> right. it's just the way it is because a 50, 50 batting average that can happen. What I find is that generally, if I get stopped out on, mo on consecutive trades, the market has changed a bit. Something has changed. Like the character of the market has changed. You know, if I go back and I say, Oh, well, I, I, executed a rational logical plan the way I normally would. And it simply didn't work. And that happens five, six times. It's usually because the market has changed. Mm -hmm. And this is again, something that um, you can develop. If you, if you have consistency in one or two strategies, you can use that feedback. Cause it's it, what, it, what it's telling you is that the, the market environment is not right for that strategy right now. So right. what I'll do is take a step back. Okay. Usually it won't take six trades to get me to take a step back. So four or five trades in a row, I'll take a step back. Maybe that means I don't place any trades for a day or two. Um, Oftentimes when that happens, I'll reduce size. So my normal mm -hmm. trade size is 50 basis points, half mm -hmm. a percentage of my total account. I'll reduce size to 25 basis points when I have a string of losses. And that's what really helps. So instead of, uh, instead of um, thinking, well, I just had five losers in a row. Now I need a monster win. Right. I better get that today. You know, my thinking is the exact opposite. Like let's, okay. let's shut it down, pull the plug, you know, don't dig yourself a hole any deeper. And my total open risk at any one given time never exceeds 6% of my total of my account. So that's just a rule. It seems really arbitrary. And it, it, there's no, there's no like statistical reasoning for it other than over time. I've found for me that that's a good number that allows me to get aggressive and hit the mm -hmm. gas, but also allows me um, to keep losses at a point where there, it's absolutely recoverable. Meaning if, if on any given day, let's say I enter, uh, you know, six positions, each of which is, a, is 1%, yeah. you know, and they, they all hit, they all hit the full loss in one day. I lose 6% on that, <laughs> on that day. Right. That's the most I ever uh, want to ever have. Happen, yeah. Right. I will never tolerate anything more than that. And it, that, I mean, very rarely does that ever happen. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I'll cut stuff a lot sooner than that. Okay. Um, but that's, that's the absolute maximum, right? So I'll, my account will never take this big nosedive, you know, like a 20, 30% nosedive that, that starts to become really insurmountable, you know, and, and that old, you know, the, the thinking, the, the simple math, the old axioms of like, if you're down 50%, you need to gain a hundred percent to get back yes. to break even that gets, that adds up real fast, right? Yeah. So I never, part of what I do is I never want to take a big drawdown. So those are the, those are simple rules stop trading when I have consecutive losses and always have a defined total open risk. Those are rules that keep me out of trouble. So when you, the way you define open risk, is that your unrealized P and L plus your, your, the math between the entry and stop or. No, so it's, it's just the original entry and the original, original risk. Okay. So once the trade goes to a break even stop, 
I consider that to be no risk, even though we all know, you know, the, you know, something horrible could happen and something could gap down below your stop. Yeah. For calculation purposes, I consider that to be no risk on. So okay, um, okay, it's only it's only what I actively have that can gotcha. that can turn into a loss, um, on the books. Yeah. Okay. So um, so you're not you're not tracking um open P and L unrealized gains. Okay. Right, um, right. I mean, that's a different thing. That's like the strategy of how you're taking partials and how you're raising your yeah. stops and everything like that. But in terms of, in terms of just flat out risk, and it's always something that number, that total open risk number is something I always want to get smaller, right? Unless mm -hmm. I'm, you know, you're, there's, you know, if I, if I have setups, I want to take, obviously the number gets bigger, but as I'm in trades, I just want to constantly get that number smaller by yeah. moving up stops and taking partials. Yeah. I just, um, <clears throat> this was like the first time I can remember in the past months where I had a stop one R in the money and then one another uh, and on another trade one R you know out of the money so my risk was zero right and it felt so good because it's been <laughs> like I've been having a really hard time so that felt so good to like have two trades on no risk essentially well yeah actually for me I, I actually I started to tweet something like this today I've done it before but um, for me, that moment where you move your stop up to break even and take a partial, that's like one of the most satisfying moments <laughs> yeah. ever, right? It's not, it's not the big win. It's not the home run. It's not the sexy stuff, but yeah. it's like your risk is gone. Your risk yeah. is gone. You've de-risked the trade and you, then you're taking a, basically a free roll at that point. Right. And that yeah. to me is like extraordinarily satisfying. I always want to get a trade to that point. Yeah. So I know you, you've been doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. Can yeah. you, can you talk about kind of like who is who are your clients what are their problems that they're having um and kind of some key takeaways one that um they're struggling with but also some lessons that maybe you've learned by teaching yeah it's been a, a fantastic experience it's, and it's definitely not a big roster of people because there's only so many hours in the day i only do this between one and three in the afternoon because i find that honestly i do most of my executing in the morning Mm -hmm. um, and then those kind of hours between one and three usually is chopping around. So that's, that's what I actually, that's when I do this coaching. That's when it fits into my schedule. So I have a small roster of people I'm working with and it ranges from people that have honestly been trading for a year or people that work in, you know, the, the, the investing trading world and, and are, okay. are, look, are just looking for, you know, someone else to talk to and, and, the, you know, different, uh, different viewpoints. So huge range of experience. Um, but I will say is that, a lot of people are really, really tough on themselves. Mm. And I think that, I think the thing, and it's, 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 it's interesting to hear, right. And it, in some ways, um, you know, I can relate to it certainly because I think we're all really tough on ourselves, but I mm -hmm. think that there's a lot of unrealistic expectations floated out there. that really plays into this. And I try to tell talk to people about this um, because I think that people expect you know, uh, you're supposed to 300, you're supposed to three X your account. You're supposed to have 300% returns every year. You know, that that's like the benchmark of being successful just because of Twitter, right? Just because yeah. of Twitter, because you'll see returns on USIC. Somebody's doing it. Somebody's yeah. three Xing yep. their account, right? That's just true. about every year. Um, and I think people kind of equate that as success. And to me, that's not reality based that, that, you know, those okay. are unrealistic expectations and I'm all for being optimistic and setting lofty goals and working hard and, and all of that. Um, but there's a point where it starts to be really detrimental to have these really unrealistic goals. Right. Um, so a lot of what I've done honestly is, is, is trying to get people in a framework where they're aligning their expectations with reality. Um, and th that comes in a lot of forms. Like if, if somebody's actively taking a swing trade defined by saying, you know, this is going to be a one, two, three, four days trade, especially in this market, you know, closer to one day, most likely, um, you know, those are your expectations. So if, if you hit two R, if you hit three R, take your gains. So like, you don't sit there and say, all right, you know, is this going to run out for the, you know, am I going to get in this for the long hauls? That's a new bull market. I'm going to, I'm going to ride this for the next six months, you know, take your gains. That was your goal. That was your defined, you find your expectations when you got into the trade. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the kinds of things I'm trying to work with people um, because a lot of people will, you know, have a gain and then they'll, they'll change their mind and, you know, their, their expectations change 
And then they'll find that the stock reverses because we're in a, such a super choppy market. And then they're left with a scratch or a loss even, right? So there's, mm -hmm. I'm doing a lot of that with people because we're in a, a super choppy market. Um, and other things that I deal with is just trying to make people focus on the logic of their, of their trade setup. Because once you have consistency in the logic of your trade setup, that's when you can start to use your own account as a barometer, right? But there, there are people I work with who, you know, you know, I'll say, explain the rationale of this trade to me, mm. um, and they won't really necessarily have one. Okay. Um, and I'm not denigrating anybody, but it's like um, they'll switch from from one strategy to the next, and and you know, maybe not be able to so easily define what their strategy was, what their tactic was, what their expectations were. So those are things I really try to refine uh, with people. Okay, so um, so really working with people to for them to understand why they put on a trade and what they're expecting to get out of a trade. Yes, it, it, I call it expectation alignment. So mm. you you have to have a a consistent logic because the market's going to do what it's going to do, right? And a lot of it is chaotic. A lot of it is can seem quite random. There, we all want to impose patterns on everything, but the market is is a living organism that's moving all over the place, and you know, right. in a million different ways. And the only way we can establish a foothold in it in any way is by by imposing our logic on the market, you know, based on setups that we're trying to take, based on asymmetrical risk reward um, setups that we have used over time. Um, and 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 if you're not doing that consistently, you're going to get always random returns. So I try mm -hmm. to I try to really make people um, kind of kind of uh, be able to elaborate and be able to enunciate what their what their rationale is for a trade. So, so that there's consistency, because I think, you know, it's one of the things that journaling does. If you really, if you really journal and you're really dedicated to it, this it's the same exercise that you're sitting there and trying to really, really state what was your reason mm. for taking this and what is your tactic for taking it more importantly, what is your tactic? Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, this is kind of like the minutia of things that I get into, but overall, I think what I've been really, uh, you know, finding is that people really do ingest this kind of Twitter craziness um, and it gets in the way of, of having realistic expectations that can help you progress in a realistic way. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> I like a year and a half ago tried options trading because, you know, of course the gain porn. And so I quickly was like, I don't, I don't even understand this. Like I try to understand because I would buy, contracts and immediately be down $700. Like the second I bought it, I'm down 700. It makes no yeah. sense. And then the next trade that I take, I'm immediately up 800. And I'm like, I don't even understand it. So I can't even do it. And so whenever I come across um, these options traders, I, for a split second, go like, maybe I should try it again. And then I go, nope, been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, options trading is a yeah. whole different thing, and there, there, you know, it introduces volatility into your account that you have to absolutely get a handle on, and and you know, it's not something to jump into without without knowing what you're doing. I I definitely have certain ways that I use options, but it's definitely different than those those people that are day trading. Yeah, options. I, I use yeah, them very differently. It's 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 unreal, but yeah, the Twitter thing. Um, so that for me because i've i've i have kind of jumped around styles to finally land where i'm at now and where i'm comfortable with um i don't even get bothered by that stuff anymore because i've been there i know that i suck at that so i don't even try it <laughs> um and i know you i know you're a big you know component of you don't day trade um was that because you've been burnt so many times day trading or is it more of a personality thing i just i don't like it I don't okay. like it. I mean, I, I definitely try. I tried everything. I mean, I tried everything. Like, yeah. oh, I tried trading indicators and, you know, I tried day, I was day trading options at one point. I've tried oh, absolutely yeah. everything, <laughs> yeah. right? Way back when, way back when. Um, so I've tried it all. I don't, what I don't like personally about day trading is it, it feels much more stressful to me. I know some people think it's much less stressful to them. And this is, again, it all comes down to your personality. Some people feel it's much less stressful because they're not holding any risk overnight, mm. right? And they, they sleep better at night just being flat. Right. Um, I don't feel that way. I don't like staring at a screen with my hand on a button, literally watching a five-minute chart, watching to see these candles bounce up and down. That has never resonated with my personality 
at all, right? So like, and putting on a decent size too. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to put on decent size day trading. I mean, it just oh, increases yeah. sweat level, right? Yeah. And, and that is not what I like. And honestly, at any given moment, like you can have a, in the market we're in right now, literally one person in the Fed can open their mouth and the market, you know, can be down two and a half percent in the blink right. of an eye, right? So that kind of exogenous risk that's out there, um, I don't like that in the day trading mm -hmm. world either. So there's a lot of things I don't like about it. Mostly it's because mostly what I don't like is that you have to be glued to the screen, at least the way I was doing it. You have to be glued to the screen. And that's not what I wanted from my, my trading life. I want trading to fit into my life. I don't want to fit my life into trading is one of the things that, you know, I, I try to keep in mind. Right. And so, and that makes total sense. Um, going back to the U S investing championship, is that something that you would consider competing in? Um, uh, what are your thoughts on that yeah, uh, for you I personally? Whole, I have a whole range of thoughts on that. So it's, it's something that quite honestly, I never paid any attention to until like the last couple of years. I've never paid any attention to it. And it's, it's because I've always felt like, um, this is just about me and my account. And that, I mean, this is, this is about me and my growth and, I'm not trying to compete with anybody. Right? I'm just mm -hmm. trying to do what I can do and, and be as good at it as I can be at it. Right. And, and, and not have these crazy expectations. Um, uh, but it, you know, I can see the benefit of it. It certainly helps people, um, get a, a form of recognition. There's no doubt. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people that, that go that route are doing it specifically for the publicity. Yeah. Um, I think it's a double-edged sword, like so many things. I mean, I think there's a lot of good that can come from it because there's a lot of really talented traders that then suddenly have a platform and, you know, right. can teach people and it get, you gain uh, credibility and things like that. But I also think that it, it, there's no way it doesn't encourage some people to take on some sort of unsustainable risk, you know? So that, yeah. that is definitely there. Like it has to be right. <laughs> I mean, it, there's yeah. gotta be some component of that because it literally is a competition. Right. Um, so, so that adds a, that adds a different component. I mean, I think it'd be, I think it'd be really interesting to ask some of the people that have been in it. Like, how did you feel about the competition part of it? Right. How does that change some of the things you do? I know that I, I've heard a lot of people say it doesn't change their style at all. Um, I don't know uh, how it wouldn't. It's gotta be difficult. It's gotta yeah. be difficult. I don't know how it wouldn't change your style. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like it's, a, I feel like there's a lot of good things to it and there, and there's, it's like everything in life, right? It's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think that, I think that the, one of the bad things that comes from it is that people will see a Mark Minervini, yeah. you know, post 330% or whatever he did. Amazingness in 2021 on a million yeah. plus account, which is, which is hardcore success, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. And then people will think, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Uh, that's what I'm supposed to do. And I saw, he, I think it was in a Richard Moglin interview uh, with Mark. And he even, I don't know who interviewed him. Maybe it was Richard. Somebody interviewed Mark and he said, um, I was trading like an animal. Yeah. And I thought that was really weird, honestly, coming from him. Because <laughs> he is the complete opposite of that. I mean, he he does not espouse trading like an animal, you know? Right. So, it that yeah. felt to me like it had gotten, you know, he was acknowledging there. There's a part yes, it's it like that, you know. Yeah, and and I think it was Richard, and um, he had, and so Mark, I'm not bashing Mark, but he says he never goes intraday. He only trades on the daily. But during that interview, he said that he was taking 400 percent positions intraday, and so you're there's no way you're putting on a 400% position and not looking at a t five or 10 minute chart. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to speak for Mark Mandarini and, and I have oh, like nothing but absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For, him. for sure. Um, but I, I, I interpreted what he was saying as I was still using the daily charts for my entries and, and my, my right. rationale, uh, but he was getting super aggressive. Like I interpreted it as he was still trading his breakouts the way he does. But yeah. He, he was loading up and bailing out fast because that was the that was the market in 2021. Yeah, was you know popping drops. So I I interpreted it. I have no idea. I'm not gonna speak for Mark, but yeah. I interpreted it as he was getting big in his usual setups, but bailing out really fast. Yeah. But I, I mean, my point is, even if a guy like Mark Minervini, who like clearly has the track record of of of, extre of extraordinary success in the market if he's in the in the u.s investing champion championship and saying he's trading like an animal you're yeah. not gonna find the phrase trading like an animal in any <laughs> <place. But> yeah. <laughs> yeah i um yeah i mean I, I would love to do it one day um but i have a one-year-old i have a five-year-old 
Um, so there's no chance that I'm going to put myself under that kind of pressure when my life already, aside from trading, has so much pressure in it. Yeah, you've got a lot going on. <laughs> I don't need that. Um, I think because you can, though. Well, this is another thing about it. It's interesting, though, because you can actually, you could just not report. if You, you could enter it and just not send your results in. <laughs> But what's interesting is I think like this year, there's something like 300 entrants um, and there's only like 12 or 13 people that are on there. And that's because those are the only people that are positive. Yeah. In the, the year. in the beginning, um, I made a few connections with a couple of uh, uh, like three or four competitors and um, they've totally ghosted. They're totally offline. Um, so right. I, I don't know what's going on. The one guy I had really – we talked to daily, and then he totally disappeared. I don't know if I said something wrong <laughs> or if he just bailed on the competition. But, you know, that's got to be very difficult, you know, because you never know when 2022 is going to, you know, kind of happen. Well, you don't You don't have to report your – your oh, okay. Uh, your progress. You don't – you can do it – you can do it or you can not do it, right? So it's a, it's a platform for you to have your, your uh, earnings – your returns verified. I okay, um, okay. And give you some press and things like that. But it, it's not like you're locked in and everybody's everybody's um everybody's monthly gains or losses are going to be reported. You you basically they don't publish anything that's below zero. So like if you've got negative returns, okay. it's not going to publish. Okay. So my point was you've got 300 people that are in the competition, but you've got yeah. about 12 in there that are po showing positive yeah. returns. Yeah. And what I'm what I'm trying to tell people, even including the people I coach with, because a lot of people focus on this list. A lot of people focus on this list. I try to say to them, that's like 290 people that enter, literally entered a competition, yeah. not because they just started trading, but because right. they are confident. You know, yeah. like, you don't just you don't just like start trading and then a month later enter the competition, right? right? So these are people yeah. that feel pretty confident. And they're probably underwater for the year. So that mm. should tell you that's the kind of thing that I want to put in people's minds is this is hard, right? This year is hard. Uh, people get frustrated. And this is one of the things I find with my, my coaching clients is that, you know, they're frustrated. And I sit there and we go over a trade and I say, you, you did nothing wrong there. There's no mistake there. This is the market we're in, right? And okay. I think those are the hardest thing, lessons to learn. And that goes back to risk management where... You know, I could sit there and say, and I do on my service, I'll be like, you know what I recommend doing tomorrow? Nothing, you know, like check in on your charts at the end of the day, go do yeah. something else. If you, if you simply can't stay away from the screen, you know, like book a dentist appointment, do something, <laughs> you know, like get yourself away from it, you know, but people have this compulsion to feel like they have to be in the action. Right. And I think getting, getting a perspective on that um, is part of this overall risk management right. um, thing, because it, the reality is. You're, you're more successful when you actually trade less. Absolutely. Um, it's extremely difficult for people to, to wrap their heads around that. Absolutely. Um, you know, this is a great conversation and I, and unfortunately we are on a time crunch here. Um, but, uh, thank you so much for your time. I, I wish we could keep going, but, um, you know, unfortunately, yeah, um, well, we are maybe in, we in another year. We'll check in. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, if you want to plug your um, Twitter and, and your service, um, you have, a you know, uh, about a, a minute to do that. <laughs> um, I, I have a, a service that I've been running, uh, you know, for a couple of years now. And really my goal is to teach reality-based trading. Right. Um, which is the opposite of the fantasy land that, that a lot of people get sold. So, um, I don't really even advertise much at all, uh, but you can go to my Twitter uh, handle at, at the equilibrium and you'll see a link to the site if you're interested um, and check it out. Perfect. Well, thanks, Matt. I really appreciate it. And I hope that we um, got some good messages across today. Yeah. Thanks, Oliver. It was nice to okay. meet you. Nice to meet you. Talk to you later. Care.